Check, check. No? Check. Check. Check, check. Is it on? It's good. We, if anyone's out there, we got to go up. Check, check. No, it can be moved as no. No? No. Yeah, it's not. Uh, the voice of God? Other games. Check. Sort of. Check. Check. Is there a volume? Is there a volume switch? That's the most. Check. 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 Oh, now it's it's a little bit better, isn't? It? Okay. Check. 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 Okay. We're good. Okay. Great. Yeah, they can hear. It. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final Poetry in the Round event of the year. My name is Russell Spriglia. I'm an associate professor in the English department here at Seton Hall. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's been a long, busy day for many of you, uh, especially with this afternoon's eclipse. Uh, to steal one of our distinguished speakers' jokes, uh, I'd say that this talk promises to be the light at the end of the tunnel, but who knows, we'll have to wait. It could be just an oncoming train, so we'll, <laughs> we'll see. That. It's too soon to tell. It'll be determined retroactively after, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> speaking of our distinguished speaker, this is Slavoj Žižek's third time visiting us here at Seton Hall in the past uh, seven years or so, so we're extremely fortunate to have him here again, uh, especially since he's coming to us all the way from Ljubljana, Slovenia. He just got in last night. So um, above all, I'd like to extend my sincerest thanks and gratitude to Slavoj for being here with us again. Uh, I'd also like to thank my colleagues in English, uh, or uh, many of my colleagues in English, including uh, the director of Poetry in the Round, uh, Dr. Uh, Nathan Oates, for his generous support of this event. Um, there are a few co-sponsors of this event as well, including the Department of English, the University Corps, and the College of Arts and Sciences. And so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Angela Weisel, Chair of the English Department, uh, Dr. Nancy Enright, the Director of the University Corps, as well as uh, my colleague in English, and uh, Dr. Jonathan Farina, Interim Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences, and another uh, English <laughs> colleague. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Sheila Riley in the Dean's Office for helping to make this uh, a reality. Uh, Michael Riccardelli and Olivia Lason in University Relations for helping to, uh, to promote this event and to advertise for it. And last but not least, uh, Christopher Petruzzi from TLTC for setting up the filming and the live streaming of it. We should be live streaming uh, right now. Uh, on Seton Hall's official YouTube channel. So a special thanks to all of those uh, who I just mentioned for making this event possible. Uh, I don't want to lose too much time by giving the typical academic introduction to Slavoj because uh, A, he's such a prolific author that it would that would be the length of the talk to um, mention all of his books. Um, although I will mention uh, one of his, his newest book, that was just published by Bloomsbury uh, a few days ago, the title of which is Christian Atheism, uh, How to Be a Real Materialist. And uh, I actually, Bloomsbury sent me a, a discount code. And so if anyone is interested in that, it's like 35% off, so the book is like $12 or something with the code. So if you're interested, um, drop me a line. You can find my email on the Seton Hall uh, English Department website. Um, so that's A, and then B, you know, whether you're here in the audience or watching on YouTube, chances are you're already well aware of who Slavoj Žižek is. In fact, I see many people in the audience who've been here for um, one or both of his past talks. Okay, so before turning things over to, to Slavoj, I just wanna say a few brief words about um, the Poetry in the Round series, um, as well as about the topic, uh, Slavoj, the advertised topic for tonight, why authoritarian leaders are obscene. So 
Uh, even though Poetry in the Round typically features poets and fiction writers, I mean, earlier this semester alone, we had two great events with the novelists Julia Mae Jonas and Martha McPhee. Uh, Seton Hall also has a rich history of inviting philosophers and literary critics and theorists to come and speak as part of the Poetry in the Round series. So, including uh, Jacques Derrida was here at some point, uh, Stanley Cavell, Harold Bloom, Jeffrey Hartman, Kenneth Burke, and, and many others. Um, what's more, Slavoj is himself a, a playwright, having published a modern-day reinterpretation of Sophocles' classic tragedy, Antigone, titled The Three Lives of Antigone, um, which was staged a few years ago uh, in, it was Dusseldorf, right? Uh, at the Agora Theater, I think? Yeah, Dusseldorf. Yes, yes. Um, also, okay. okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> an, opera. an opera as well. Um, uh, I mention this not just because we're here at Poetry in the Round, uh, you know, it's so a literature event, but also because there's a clear link between Sophocles' play and the topic of Slavoj's talk tonight, the obscenity of authoritarian leaders. Um, Slavoj's good friend and fellow Slovenian uh, psychoanalytic philosopher, Alenka Zupancic, uh, in her recent book on Antigone, Let Them Rot, uh, she stresses that though the authoritarian King Creon, right, Antigone's uncle, who orders that she be buried alive for defying his decree against burying his traitor nephew, Antigone's brother Polynices, um, though the authoritarian Creon is often viewed as standing for the law of the state, in contrast to Antigone, right, who's supposed to represent the law of the gods, or so the standard reading goes, Creon's punishment of Polynices, leaving his corpse exposed for food for the birds, um, is based, this is uh, Zupancic, neither on human nor divine law, but is in fact an excess that stains the normal rule with an ineffaceable pathology, that pulls pathology into the very core of the normal rule. So by forbidding Polynices' burial, Creon has not simply perpetuated the standard objective violence of the given rule, but has himself performed a gesture of excessive um, subjective violence in the name of the state and the public law. So that's the obscene excess of that particular authoritarian leader. So briefly, extremely briefly, what does this have to do with our current um, political situation? Well, as Slavoj has written about uh, in a number of different venues and occasions recently, this one is from your, the pandemic, uh, the second pandemic book, and I'll stop with this. Um, this is a quote from Slavoj. Traditionally, shameless obscenity works subversively as an undermining of traditional domination, as depriving the authoritarian master of his false dignity. However, what is happening today with the growth of public obscenity is not the disappearance of authority, of master figures, but its forceful reappearance. We are getting something that was unimaginable now, decades ago, obscene masters. The obscene political figures of today are quite the opposite to the Stalinist figure of the leader who is kept unblemished at any price. While the Stalinist leader fears that even a minor indecency uh, or imperfection would destroy his position, our new leaders are willing to go quite far in renouncing their dignity. And so I could give a number of examples of this, but um, from here at home to across the globe, but I'm going to leave such exemplifications to our speaker. So uh, please join me in welcoming back to Seton Hall my good friend Slavoj Žižek. Thank you very much. I hope the talk will not be too boring for you because I will uh, 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 condense, repeat some stuff which I already developed in other books, but uh, let me, so let me go to the point. There are multiple signs indicating that we are in the midst of a, sorry, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, of a very disturbing worldwide process what is going on, the basic social pact which holds together a society is bursting at its seams. Such a time is ripe for craziest rumors to circulate. Even if they are obviously nonsensical, such rumors give body to our deepest fears and prejudices. For example, in late August 2023, in a ceremony in the city of 
Velikie Lukim in Russia's Novgorod region, a priest called Father Anthony doused holy water on a 26-foot-high statue of Stalin. He said that during Stalin's time in power, I quote, if we are being honest, the church suffered, but added that thanks to this, we have lots of new Russian martyrs and confessors to whom we now pray and are helping us in our motherland's resurgence. You see the absurdity of this idea. Bless Stalin because he created martyrs, which, and so on and so on. This line of argumentation is one step from claiming that Hitler deserves a blessing from Jews because his crimes played a key role in opening up the way to the rise of the state of Israel. Is this a bad joke? Unfortunately, no. There are some Zionist extremists close to the present Israeli government who openly advocate this stance. A quote, for years, God has been screaming that the diaspora is over, but Jews aren't obeying. That is their disease that the Holocaust must cure. So again, the idea was, God was telling the Jews, return to your land. Jews were too sinful, too immersed in Western European life, so Hitler unknowingly was working as divine messenger and so on and so on. Now, not to lose time with such anecdotes, how can we explain the success of such perverted argumentation? We have to proceed in two steps. First, we have to take into account the surplus enjoyment that such perversion gives birth to. Recall the ISIS attack on a Crocus City Hall in Moscow, now two weeks ago, on March 22nd, where over 130 people were killed. There is something almost unbelievable that happened after this attack. While we can safely surmise that all state, states torture their captured alleged terrorists, Russian security forces not only publicly admitted this torturing, but displayed it in the mass media. For example, in a graphic video posted on Telegram, one of the official video, whatever, podcasts of Russia, one of the detained had his ear cut off and was then forced to eat it by one of his interrogators. No wonder that some Israeli hardliners already claim that Russia has shown them how to deal with arrested Hamas members. So why are they doing it? Again, you got it what I'm saying. I was shocked. We all know everybody secretly tortures. Now this is becoming public spectacle. You show it, and the only example is not here. Uh, there is a crazy half-dictator, but very popular, re-elected in, in, uh, uh, in El Salvador, who is, uh, 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 who is uh, eliminating gangs by arresting thousands and putting them, torturing them in incredibly crowded prisons. And uh, again, uh, 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 all this is public. You can follow it live on TV. It's no longer this discreet obscenity, you know, rumors that guy was tortured and so on. It's uh, public. So I think they are doing this not just to scare the potential future attackers, but also to give pleasure to the viewers. Margarita Simonian, a Russian uh, propaganda writer, head of the state-owned media outlet RT, Russia Today, wrote upon these pictures of torture, I never expected this from myself, but when I see how they 
the terrorists are brought into the court, crooked, and even this ear cut off, I feel extremely satisfied. And I think this is clearly all around the world one of the tendencies today. We are gradually returning to the pre-modern practices of publicly torturing to death the alleged criminals. The first step in this direction was already made, do you remember this, it was in the media, I think, around a year ago, when some southern states here in the US debated the possibility of publicly hanging uh, uh, criminals. This is so one point, the pleasure of seeing people tortured, and I don't want to bore you here, but this has a wonderful theological background. There was in Middle Ages a big debate about if you enter heaven, are you allowed to see what goes on in hell? And the argument was yes, because in heaven your knowledge should be much broader than on this earth, so why not? But then, and Thomas Aquinas, the greatest medieval theologist, openly uh, approaches this problem. If this is true, is this not something, uh, is, this, is this not a perversion? Like, people in heaven enjoy seeing the, those in hell being tortured. Okay, Aquinas produces an incredible argument, claiming, which is obviously false argument, claiming that yes, you enjoy it, but you don't enjoy seeing the others in pain. What you enjoy is the magnitude of divine justice, that you enjoy justice being done. Obviously, this doesn't function. So in one, I forgot which one of my earlier books, I developed a whole theory that maybe, you know, maybe what? If you know Dante, you know that uh, hell is the only interesting part, you know. <laughs> nobody reads, wise, absolutely nobody reads uh, uh, paradise except, I think, the last two, three lines. How the, the God, I, sees himself, whatever, infinite love. We only read hell. So my idea is this one. <laughs> that uh, hell, hell is maybe not such a bad place. You have oil burning, you dance, it's nice and warm, you do what you <laughs> Americans like to do with meat, you do all the roasting and so on. Then, that was my dream. Uh, every, like once a week for an hour or two, some devil's servant comes and said, okay, Volk, now, be careful, pretend that you are in pain, because the camera will be on for those in heaven. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And then at, after one hour he said, okay, it's over, we can uh, enjoy again, and so on, you know. That I think many theologists take this quite seriously. The, I will not go lose my time with it, but the the deepest the uh, theologians claim that it's a beautiful thought that Christ is with us in hell. And some of, I will not go into it, but you, if you are in theology, I am an atheist Christian, I define myself, that, <coughs> that uh, uh, some of these mystics, I forgot which one, medieval, European, this is unique of Europe, I think, even proposed the formula that uh, better to be with Christ in hell than with God the Father in heaven. That the only authentic Holy Spirit in the sense of sacred community of equals is with Christ in hell. But okay, let's not get lost uh, here. Uh, I want to add, now comes more problematic stuff, another step. 
it's not enough to say that we enjoy seeing torture. We would be too embarrassed to directly see, or see, see this, although, you know, I, uh, I read a book about history of torture, which really depressed me, how this ultra-sensitivity towards public torture is strictly a modern phenomenon, not only as Michel Foucault deploys in early modernity, but even later, for example, it's really depressing to read this. Even up till mid-19th century, one of the main public attractions, especially for the poor people in England, was publicly, slowly, extremely painfully torturing bears, horses, animals to death. It was proclaimed like, come buy tickets, uh, uh, a bear will be painfully, slowly, exquisitely tortured, and so on and so on. So again, this invisibility of torture and death is a modern phenomenon. So how can we make, in, how can we enjoy it? Now comes my most problematic point, maybe for some of you, and here I enter poetry to horrify you. Uh, we need poetry. I, you know, I'm sick and tired as a philosophy of listening these stories about how uh, you philosophers screwed it up everything. You know, this Karl Popper open. It began with philosophers, Plato, the first totalitarian, and at the end of this road are Hitler, Stalin, whatever you want. No. What about poets? I mean, uh, uh, just, uh, just go through the list of poets who were hardline, much more than communists, uh, uh, sympathetic to fascists. Look at my beloved, I love the country, Ireland, William Butler Yeats. You know, he was saved by his relatively early death because he already accepted in 38 or when an invitation to Germany and Goebbels, Hitler's uh, uh, culture minister, organized everything. He would have gotten the highest German medal and Hitler would receive him and so on and so on. So uh, uh, what I want to say is this. You know, probably don't know, who was Ernst Jünger. He was a German social theorist. Uh, he was not directly a Nazi, but a fellow traveler of the Nazis, like something like Proud Boys today in the US. Uh, uh, he, his big motive is celebrating the purifying e effect of military struggle. Here is a beautiful quote from Ernst Jünger. Any power struggle is preceded by a verification of images and iconoclasm. This is why we need poets. They initiate the overthrow, even that, the overthrow of titans. So I find this fascinating, this idea that, as I put it somewhere, and I was cursed for it, that uh, behind every ethnic cleansing there is a poet. Just look for it. I was speaking, of course, from my own experience in the Civil War, you are too young, most of you to remember it, in ex-Yugoslavia, where it wasn't only Radovan Karadzic, the president of the Serb part of Bosnia, but also with all other nations. You need poetry to legitimize it. If not poetry, then some sacred poetic texts and so on and so on. The logic is this one. I will try to be very precise here. Uh, uh, the, the basic trick that's necessary is to change the ethical coordinates in the sense that the starting point is whatever is this. However inhuman egotist we are, usually we do have some let's call it naively, basic minimum of decency. Like, as much as I hate you, 
but if somebody were to give me a knife to stab you, I would have slight problems, no light, no? <laughs> and here poetry enters. Why? Poetry has to convince you that what appears to you from your common everyday morality as an inhuman crime is really the highest sacrifice for the benefit of your, uh, of, of your country, your nation, and so on. It's interesting how, although they are very different, uh, Stalinism and Nazism are similar here. For example, I read an interesting book, late 20s, about how the so-called Holodomor, the mass starvation killing of farmers in Ukraine, late 1920s, the first big violent act of Stalin, early 30s, uh, when they collected cadre people, who were then sent to the villages to beat farmers, to force them to voluntarily accept collectivization. It's interesting that the logic was this one. Yes, you will have to do horrible things. You will have to see children starving, beat mothers, and so on. But if you feel any sympathy for it, this means that you are uh, betraying your country. This, so, you prove to be a real patriot by leaving behind your most elementary decency, or as the counterpart to Stalin, not Hitler himself, but Heinrich Himmler, the uh, organizer of Holocaust, as he, uh, uh, as he put it, uh, 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 any compassion with, let's say, a starving Jew or blah, 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 any compassion equals treason. Or, again, as Himmler says even more radically at some point, any idiot can sacrifice his love, his life, sorry, for his country. It takes a true hero to sacrifice his soul for his country, to do horrible crimes. That's the ethical trick. And again, for this, you need something like poetry. I'm not saying poetry, I'm not crazy, can be reduced to it. I'm just saying you need something like poetry at its worst. Now I will go to, I hope for some of you, a more amusing part, if this can be <laughs> amusing. The trouble I got into in India and then I was attacked by many on the web, especially from India, so I was told, when I made a remark about the movie, I hope most of you saw it, uh, uh, Oppenheimer. You remember that scene quarter of an hour into the movie when there is a sex act between Oppenheimer and Gene Tetlock, played by Florence Pugh, and they make love at that point uh, I even don't know who asks whom. I think he asks her, read me Bhagavad Gita while we are making love. And already many Indian institutions reacted. This is an obscenity. You have there illegitimate dirty sex and to accompany it our most sacred book. Then I made a mistake for which some of my friends then told me, for like half a year, don't go to India, no. <laughs> because I said that I agree with Indians, but the other way around. My idea was that it's a beautiful, tender sex act, spoiled by one of the, for me, nastiest, dirtiest book in the history of humanity, <laughs> Bhagavad Gita. People thought, am I crazy? I think I am not. Let me go a little bit more in detail into it. There are in that, how do you call that uh, site where they debate people, Reddit or what? Yeah. yeah. I found there a site where I'm attacked for, again, misunderstanding so-called oriental thought. I will read you just two quotes. First quote, Zizek is wrong when he says Eastern's approach to looking inwards to achieve knowledge will lead to find hate, so we should avoid it. He, me, is extremely wrong about this because he doesn't understand Brahman, Bhagavad Gita, 
or even the philosophies of Quakerism, which in fact are Western. All of them teach that when you truly look inside to find inside yourself, to find knowledge, what you will find is that we are all part of the same and we should find a way to heal by uniting in peace. If Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, already really mentioned it, use this logic, I am not my actions, therefore I can do whatever I want, then he didn't really look inward, but instead only scratched the surface enough to justify his evil actions, and so on and so on. The second attack on me, in an interview, I, Zizek, also said how the issue with Oriental philosophy is that it says to look deeply within yourself to find truth. While Slavoj, me, believes if you look deep into you, you will find there nothing. The self is an illusion. Now, the guy goes on against me. The ignorance of this is amazing because that's exactly what Oriental religion is about. That there is no self, it's a void, and so on. So what's my reply to this? The first thing that strikes the eye is the contradiction of these two critiques of mine. If we look deep into ourselves, do we find there nothing, or do we see that we are all part of the same divinity? The difference is here between Hinduism, Bhagavad Gita, where you have this unity of my eternal self and universal spirituality, it's doubtful if we can call it simply God, and the Buddhist stance, which poses that there is no substantial self behind the appearances, so that self is an illusion. And I'm Coming now back to Heinrich Himmler, he adored Bhagavad Gita, not Buddhism. It's very interesting that Himmler always held in his pocket a special, specially made copy of Bhagavad Gita. Why? Uh, Himmler had an ethical problem. He was well aware that SS officers had to do horrible things in killing the Jews and so on. Like, I don't know, beating small children, dragging children, from blah, blah. So his point was, how can a Nazi do this without becoming a beast? Because these are beastly things. And his answer was Bhagavad Gita. Now, I'm not saying Bhagavad Gita legitimizes Holocaust. I'm saying but that if you today do things like Holocaust, it's pretty obvious where a reference to Bhagavad Gita can be of some help. Why? Here comes a long quote, uh, which I think is from the crucial passage in Bhagavad Gita. The god Krishna answers Arjuna, the warrior king who hesitates entering a battle, horrified at the suffering his attack will cause. So again, Arjuna is more or less a normal human being. He sees there is enemies early, my army, my God. If I attack, tens of thousands will die. Do I have the right to do it? Here is the answer of Krishna, of God. Quote, he who thinks it to be the killer, and he who thinks it to be killed, both know nothing. The self kills not, and the self is not killed. It is not born, nor does it ever die. Nor having existed, does it exist no more. Unborn, everlasting, unchangeable, and primeval, the self is not killed when the body is cold. How can that man who knows the self to be indestructible, everlasting, unborn, how and whom can he kill? Whom can he cause to be killed? As a man casting off old clothes, puts on others and new ones, so the embodied self, casting off old bodies, goes to others and new ones. It 
it is everlasting, all-pervading, stable, firm, and eternal. It is said to be unperceived, to be unthinkable, to be unchangeable. Therefore, you ought not to grieve for any being. Having re regard to your, own duty, to your own duty, you ought not to falter, for there is nothing better than a righteous battle. Killed, you will obtain heaven. Victorious, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore, arise, resolve to engage in battle. It's absolutely clear what... Uh, what Himmler liked in this passage. Like this cycle of life, death, body, this is just a play of appearances at the deeper spiritual level. If you look deep into yourself, there is neither death nor any change and so on. So go and kill. Don't be, don't hesitate to do it. Uh, so my Ironic idea is to paraphrase this passage as the justification of the burning of Jews in the gas chambers. Let's say that the executor, the one, the Nazi, who uh, presses the button for gas to be released, has a moment of doubt. Isn't logical to tell him, since he who thinks is to be the killer and he who thinks is to be killed both know nothing, since the self kills not and the self is not killed. Therefore, you ought not to grieve for any burned Jews, but looking alike on pleasure and pain, on gain or loss, on victory or defeat, do whatever you are ordered to. So, uh, uh, again, Himmler referred to this so-called stance of don't identify with your acts. Remain at a distance, and in this way, whatever horrible things you are doing in actual life, you can, again, remain at a distance. You, your ethical even, purity is not, is not uh, affected by it. I think that... Uh, we should reject radically this stance. Here I am, even with Buddhism, it gets more complex, but here I will return and improvise a little bit about Antigone. I uh, don't want to go too deep into it. I can suppose you know the story. Uh, uh, what I did, but I changed my mind now, in my trilogy, the drama, is that you know what is the official ending? Antigone is buried alive and then kills herself and uh, who is her uh, lover? Not, uh, ha Hammond, yes. Hangs himself, dies with her and so on. My idea is a very simple and brutal one. With me, there are three lives, three versions. The second version, Antigone wins, convinces Creon, her uncle, that she is right, and her uncle says, okay, let's do a proper burial for Polynicus, Polynices, and the result is, because Polynices was a traitor, that people revolt, the whole city of Thebes is in fire, and the, the situation is even more catastrophic. Then, there is a third version, which is my favorable one, a hardline communist one, where while Antigone and Creon are fighting, the chorus, which is usually the conformist bunch of men who just say platitude, steps forward and says, no, you are destroying the city with your stupid struggle. You both should be liquidated and people will take over. And they execute first Creon and then Antigone. Then... Alenka Zupancic wrote a book, short one, but excellent, uh, uh, Let Them Rot, which I think provides a way to rehabilitate uh, Antigone. Namely, she focuses on a passage in which, there is where, this is where the title of her book comes from, 
She quotes a passage, the crucial one, where Antigone explains what, why she insists on the proper funeral rituals for her brother. Here I friendly disagree with Judith Butler, who, whose position is, I think, more that of, let's call it, a liberal universalism. His idea is that usually our universality are, imply exceptions. You know, human rights, yes, but not gay rights, but not other races, but that we should effectively universalize the right. So, if funeral is for all people, why not also for Polynakers? But read Antigone, you will discover incredible things there. The final reason given by Antigone is not, oh, even if he is a criminal, my brother deserves to be buried. No, it's the exact opposite. She says, if it were for my children, my father, my mother, husband even, let them rot. I wouldn't care about, it's only for my brother. Uh, I don't want to go into it. Why? She, uh, the reasons, you find all this in Alenka's book, but uh, the crucial point is that her ethical gesture Founding, et, grounding ethical gesture, I think, is not a universalist one. It's not in the logic of all people have rights, why not also gays, trans people, whatever, or in racial terms, or the poor, and so on. No, her logic is exactly the opposite. Who cares about universality? <laughs> Let them rot. I begin with this exception. I begin with but. Let them rot, but there is one exception. And it's, it makes a great problem for readers of Antigone. Goethe was, Johann Volg, was the first one of those who suggested, because he didn't have a proper reading of this, that probably this was a later insertion, whatever, no. And even Judith Butler, has doubts, is this really part of, and so on and so on. But I, I think that it's crucial to insist on this point, that a, a proper ethical gesture, radical one, always functions first as an exception. You know, you are in the existing oppressive regime. And you said, okay, okay, okay. But at a certain point, you say, but this is enough. You begin with exception. And in this way, you ground a new universality. But it begins as an exception. OK, I will not go now into, let me stop. This was just a diversion. I, will, I would like to uh, uh, apply this, obviously, but positions are clear there. I don't want to go too much into Gaza, Middle East uh, politics, and so on. I just want to say that, uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, that uh, the key for me, and I will come back to my topic, the key for me of this situation is the although, of course, Palestinians are suffering, the situation in Israel itself. Do you remember what was going on in Israel uh, in the month before October 7th? There was a tremendous public disorder, hundreds of thousands, demonstrating against the Netanyahu government and the way he wanted to subordinate uh, the Supreme Court, I think. And I, this is why I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying uh, uh, Netanyahu asked uh, Hamas to attack. But it served him perfectly, because all of a sudden, we no longer even talk about that. The news were full about the struggle in Israel. And now comes my surprise. You know 
who is for me, maybe even more than the so-called uh, liberal opposition, the decent people who say, who say something very important. They don't say, oh, we are going too far there. They are saying we, by doing what we are doing in Gaza, we are betraying the deepest Jewish spirituality. Let me give you an example. Did you follow that scandal with Jonathan Glazer, the zone of interest, his Hollywood speech? I haven't yet met him, but I'm very good friends with people who are very good friends with him. And they told me a very interesting story. This guy is not a believer, Glazer, but he's deep into Jewish spirituality. And at the beginning of October the 7th, he was shocked. Yes, we should take revenge, blah, blah, blah. Then gradually seeing what Israel is doing in Gaza, he became horrified, not in the sense of, okay, I'm not only a Jew, what about the humanity uh, of Palestine? But in a much deeper sense, in the sense of, are we not with what we are doing in Gaza, betraying our deepest Jewish spirituality. That's what frustrated, uh, that's what frustrated many people who attacked him. He did not say, I reject my Jewishness. He said the exact opposite. I reject the way my deepest Jewish spirituality is misused there. So, uh, uh, whom then can we trust? Okay, don't, I know one should be critical to all sides. Don't be afraid. I'm not a voice of uh, ISIS or whatever. But I hope you will agree. That's how you should do politics today. Look at voice of reason where you would never have expected to find it. I am, don't laugh. I'm an old friend of secret police, secret services. I think that quite often they are the only voice of reason. You know who is my favorite guy? There are two, uh, I will quote just one. Uh, Ami Ayalon, a former, now retired leader of Shin Bet. You know, you have two secret services in Israel. Mossad for external affairs, Shin Bet for eternal. And my God, if you say today in Germany, for example, what Ayalon publicly said on January 14th uh, uh, this year, you would have been arrested probably in Germany. I'm quoting the boss, ex-boss of Secret Service. We Israelis will have security only when they, Palestinians, will have hope. This is the equation. Israel will not have security until Palestinians have their own state, and Israeli authorities should release Marwan Barghouti, the jailed leader of the Second Intifada, to, uh, uh, and so to open negotiations with him. Again, quote from Barghouti, look into the Palestinian polls. He, Barghouti, is the only leader who can lead Palestinians to a state alongside Israel. First of, of all, because he believes in the concept of two states, and secondly, because he won his legitimacy by sitting in our jails. So uh, it's incredible. This is what the boss of secret police is saying, if you think this is an exception, uh, look at the best documentary I know, among others. They have excellent documentary movie makers in Israel. Uh, uh, I forgot the guy who did it. It's called uh, uh, Gatekeepers. Interviews with the past six leaders of Shin Bet and uh, Mossad. They are incredible. They all said we were misused by the politicians. We were all the time telling them, uh, telling them you don't take into account the true situation. We never got the clear line what to do with Palestinians and so on and so on. So don't we, do we not live in a sad time when 
the, the subversive things to say is to quote not ISIS and Hamas, but the, the leaders of Israeli secret police who are extremely rational and see clearly what is happening. The point is, I go now back to my main line, that uh, uh, this type of flirting with danger in the sense of approaching, a, let's call it a permanent emergency state. This is unfortunately what is becoming more and more universal in our time. For example, one of the examples, back to India. Narendra Modi himself once said that uh, when he, uh, his attention was drawn to the idea that the pressure from authorities is so strong in India that many ordinary people feel under threat. He said, yes, there is a fear that now runs through the country. This is a fear instilled in traitors, and it is good that they are, uh, that they are afraid. Uh, we can go on here in your country. Uh, 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 you know, let's not just make fun of the so-called third world countries. I will return to it later, but let's not mention. Uh, Trump is using the same language of emergency state. He says again and again, if I lose elections, then it will be because of Taylor Swift. This is one person. No? But mostly he's saying it will be cheating. We will go to the... He track explicitly. He introduces the language of uh, emergency. So this is what... Let me go on. This is what really worries me. Today, every stance of religious fundamentalism turns into its opposite, into a figure of moral decay. What do I mean by this? Our basic moral edifice is not just hypocritical. It always was hypocritical. But it is today losing even the hypocritical force of appearance. Don't underestimate the appearances. I think it's better to have a hypocritical moral law, human rights, than to have no law at all. Because this is my argument against those in the so-called, I don't know what would be the politically correct term, third world, who claim Western human rights are hypocritical, so let's drop them. The problem for me is that at least Western human rights set certain standards which then can be turned also against Western powers themselves. If you drop that, you don't get authentic rights and freedom. You get just pure, simple violence. Here I would like to quote somebody whom I appreciate very much, another formidable figure from India, you know, the writer. Arundhati Roy. She remarked, apropos Gaza bombing, that if this bombing will go on, then, a quote, then the moral ar architecture of Western liberalism will cease to exist. It was always hypocritical, we know. But even that provided some sort of shelter. That shelter is disappearing before our eyes. End of quote. Crucially here, the idea that in spite of its hypocrisy, the liberal moral edifice nonetheless provided some sort of shelter. And again, I think that today this no longer works. Look at, uh, if you say to people, for example, in Gaza, Western moral values, human rights, and then, usually they add, nonetheless, Israel is the only democracy there it stands for, and a guy from Gaza will tell you, yes, we see human rights every day in the form of bombs falling on us. It's a, it's a total, it's a catastrophe. So again, 
stick to appearances. Why is this important? Let me go a little bit more quickly. Something which makes me extremely sad is happening in the last month. I think the best symbol of what goes on today is maybe today's Haiti. You read in the newspapers, I hope, what is going on there. The more or less, not quite, but more or less, the public authority simply disintegrated. It was corrupt already, and gangs, criminal gangs, took over. It doesn't matter that gangs, some of them even use, uh, um, even use uh, revolutionary rhetoric. They refer to Martin Luther King, Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, even Robin Hood, and so on. But they are gangs. There is no public order. Now, I will not go into details here, but I just want to add that now you will say Haiti is an extreme case. No, I already mentioned uh, 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 Salvador, then Ecuador also, gangs are taking over. Uh, what really worries me, now let's move to more the so-called developed state. In Russia, do you remember uh, the Wagner group? This was exactly the same. This was basically a private army in other words, a criminal gang, tolerated and used by the state so that the state could use them and then maintain deniability. Oh, it's them, we didn't do it, and so on and so on. Uh, even in Iran, Iranian friends are telling me that the so-called revolutionary guard works a little bit like that, you know. The top guys, uh, maintain a minimum of distance so that they can say <coughs> it's not us. Then let me go a step further. Aren't in Israel, uh, aren't the West Bank settlers a similar thing? They are basically gangs which, I mean, just go to, to, to YouTube and put it, and you get dozens, if not hundreds, of, 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 uh, of shots, of uh, clips of the violence. They are terrorizing local Palestinians. Again, everybody knows they are operate outside the law, but the state not only ignores, but silently supports it. No wonder, this is really a bad joke, that the ongoing Minister for National Security, Itamar Ben-Gvir, you know that he was 15 years ago or when, uh, accused as a terrorist. By whom? By the Israeli court. This guy is now Minister for National uh, Security. So, uh, uh, what worries me again, it's a general phenomenon which worries me here. What worries me is that uh, it is as if the, in, even in our Western democracies, uh, we are getting something like failed states. I define them as states which were the, those in power or those aiming to be in power cannot function without a support of gangs out of law. And even United States are now in a difficult predicament because you remember, Biden did apply some restrictions that the leaders of, uh, the leaders of these settlers, they are not allowed to enter United States, blah, blah. But we are talking about 10 or 14 people. That's ridiculous. The symbol of the role of the United States now is, you can find it easily on YouTube, a wonderful photo shot by a journalist uh, a week or two ago. In one and the same shot, you see Israeli bombs, but made by United States, so bombs produced by United States falling down, and it happened. Immediately behind them, uh, 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 
parachuting uh, American food parcels falling down, you know. It's uh, what, again, what worried me, and again, in the United States, you have proud boys. Yes, Trump did make, uh, take a distance uh, towards them, but, uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's deniability. Again, I think that you are in much more serious situation than it may appear. Because, you know, democracy is not just plurality. Democracy means also that all parties, political agents, accept basic rules. Although it was probably a dirty trick, but this was for me also democracy. You remember when uh, uh, Al Gore lost for literally two, three hundred votes in Florida and that by, uh, against Bush, and Bush became president. You can protest, but when votes are counted, even if it's unjust, you have to accept it. The moment you don't accept it, it's open, uh, open, uh, uh, it's open civil war. That's why now I come to my really pessimist uh, conclusion. That's why uh, today uh, I think maybe the time has come to turn around Lincoln's it's attributed to him, but of course, nothing is original. I mean, he took it, it's proven from another. You know, Lincoln's one of his most famous sayings. You can cheat all the people sometimes, some people all the time, but you cannot cheat, deceive all people all the time. I'm becoming more of a pessimist. I think basically you can. <laughs> Maybe from time to time there is a miracle. Or as a guy who is very much against my type of <coughs> theory, but I appreciate him very much. The Norwegian uh, rational choice theorist John Elster remarked about the phrase fashionable today that democracy is under threat. He says we can reverse the common dictum that democracy is under threat and affirm that democracy is the threat, at least in its short-term populist form. And this is why so many of the leftists criticize me in Europe when I say immigrants are a problem, not in the sense that I'm against them. I'm just telling them this. The majority is against, more and more, unfortunately, in Europe, is against the immigrants. So sooner or later, if we don't approach this topic in a totally different way, the problem will be either democracy or tolerance of immigrants, because if we give free reign to democracy, that it is already happening. Sweden, Finland, uh, then uh, uh, even Slovakia, I think, and so on. In Germany, maybe the next election in France, Marine Le Pen will. You know why there we are in Europe not more tough against immigrants? Because finally, even those who are against immigrants are getting the point. The developed Western European countries depend to such an extent on even illegal immigrants. All the lower paid jobs are done by them. For example, in Sweden, I read a report how in, how do you call uh, home for the old care, nursing home? Yeah, nursing home. Nursing homes, hospitals, and so on it's over 80% uh, immigrants. In Germany, they discover, if Alternative for Germany takes over and they throw out immigrants, it's immediate total economic fiasco, and so on. So what I'm saying is that uh, I am becoming uh, <laughs> like the, skeptical in the sense that, you know, there is an old, Marxist tradition, which claims that there is a privileged subject of emancipation. For Marx, it was the exploited working class, no? Like, they are, due to their, let's call it objective economic situation, pushed towards, not necessarily, but the privileged subject. All others, struggles, 
should be ultimately subordinate. Minority struggles, uh, 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 colonized people, women. As the traditional Marxist said to women and others, wait a little bit, let allow us to do revolution, and then we will <laughs> solve that. Now, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, today, uh, uh, not only today, the whole history of Marxism was a history of this, of how working class didn't turn into revolutionary subject, so we get this desperate search for another ersatz revolutionary subject. It was colonized people, like this is the radical Maoist theory, that Western working class is already totally part of bourgeois world, totally compromised. So only the colonized people can be. Then some feminists claim women. Then the 68 uh, illusion was students. Things are much more complex here. Did you notice something very strange? Okay, you didn't because you were not born then, but I remember. I'm unfortunately old enough. 68, 70s, hippies, all the protests here and in Europe, Germany, France. There is something that many leftists are not ready to approach here, a terrifying thing, that uh, all those protests exploded, not when the situation of the majority was the worst, but when it was at its best. 60s, I remember, and early 70s, were the high point of welfare state. Then already with the old crisis of early 70s, it went down. You know, uh, rights were taken from, but exact, so exactly in the golden era of welfare state, you get big protests. And the lesson is very sad for those in power. It's like, uh, if you want to prevent protests, you should take care that people, ordinary people are not doing too well. You know, because if they are not too, doing too well, they will, and so on, and so on. The story is clear. So, uh, uh, you know, I used a joke. I made it, paraphrasing, paraphrasing uh, another joke uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from old uh, communist Russia. I like it. With, uh, uh, imagine this scene. That's where you are, I claim. Imagine that the three leaders today, strong men, uh, 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 Trump, Xi, Xi, how do you pronounce it? Xi, the, the Chinese boss, and Putin are allowed to confront God and are allowed to ask God one question. First, Putin begins, tell me what will happen to Russia in next decades. God answers, Russia will gradually become a Chinese province. Putin turns around and starts to cry. Then she asks the same question. What will happen to China in next decades? God answers, Chinese economic miracle will be over. China will have to return to a hardline dictatorship to survive and even it will have to ask Taiwan for help or occupy. <laughs> she turns around and starts to cry. If you know by books, you know what comes now. Then Trump asks, tell me what will be the fate of the United States if I take power again? God turns around and starts to cry. <laughs> and I think it is true, you know why? Because in spite of all the critique of American imperialism, I agree. Nonetheless, America is still, in the eyes of millions in the third world, not in its actuality, but an ideal. It stands for something. For example, I remember, you again don't, when there was that Tiananmen revolt in 1990-89, some protesters there built a statue of liberty in a primitive way and so on, but some kind from wood paper, but they did. It's clear that they didn't refer to 
United States. This was for them a symbol for what they wanted, more social justice, freedom, and so on and so on. And I think if you imagine God saying, <laughs> react, that this is what God meant. We, if Amer United States fall down, if Trump comes to power, you know what will happen? You know this idea of third world countries joining this BRICS block, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, 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 China, and uh, South Africa. I don't like it. You know why? Because it's a kind of a fake pluralism under global capitalism. It basically means we collaborate at the level of common market, but in internal politics, you kill your own people, do whatever you want, I kill my own. The model of BRICS is for me what happened, do you remember, the moment in when Taliban took over in Afghanistan. They immediately made a deal with China. The deal was, you allow us to do with women what we want, we allow you to screw the Muslims, Uyghurs in that province the way you want. It's, uh, uh, this is why I'm not too glad, although I consider myself leftist, I define myself these days as a moderately conservative communist. It's another story. Why. <laughs> but what I want to say is that, you know, as a Hegelian, when somebody comes with a big optimist idea, my first reaction is always, my God, is it just like this? Let's look at possible negative implications. And I see them. If Trump wins, United States will become one among the BRICS states, you know. And Trump openly says this. He says, who cares about Europe? Let Russia invade it, and so on and so on. And I think that this world will be a world without global coordination, without, in Hegel's terms, universality. But today we need more than ever universality. We cannot survive without this. Let me give you a proof from your own country. You remember, you are not so young, when it was uh, two and a half years ago, the summer, when uh, that, uh, 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 Seattle, Vancouver, no? southwest of Canada, North United States, temperatures reached for a week almost 50 degrees Celsius. It was hotter there, warmer than in, than, than in, uh, than in uh, those, all those uh, Emirates and so on, where they are used to 50 degrees. So they were not directly responsible for it. Those parts of the world, northern United, Seattle, Vancouver, they are probably relatively responsible. Uh, theoretically, uh, I mean, sorry, ecologically. The problem is global. The problem is the whole circulation of air around the northern, uh, uh, northern pole is disturbed. You can only approach them, and all our problems, I claim today, are like, are like this. Why? Did you see the novel is excellent? The, the cinema, the TV version is so-so. Did you read that famous novel, Three Body Problem? You find it now on Netflix? Okay, I will not go into the story, but this idea of three solaris, a planet which threatens to invade Earth, where the intelligent life develops, but there are three suns which chaotically turn around the planet, so that it's unpredictable in the sense that it's chaotic. They don't know when there will be next summer, there is heat for seven years, then all of a sudden too much rain and so on. I think we don't need to imagine a uh, three solaris. This is where we are today. It's even worse. First, global warming. The problem is that we have a wrong idea about it, you know in what sense. We the common idea of global warming is that things are, will be just a little bit warmer, but then there will be again a regular rhythm, summer, winter, just with higher temperatures. But many intelligent ecologists claim, what if the nature itself would get destabilized? So it's not just the same sheet like today, but I don't know. 
how many degrees higher, is that the weather will be simply chaotic. A year you will have no summer, then whatever, and so on. Then the most dangerous thing, we don't have three suns, but we have three, four mega crises. And how do they relate? We have ecological crisis. We have immigrant crisis. We have the war threat and so on. How do they, do, will they reinforce each other or will maybe even happen that, for example, a serious ecological catastrophe will unite us and we will say, fuck it, why should we, when all our lives are threatened, why should we uh, even uh, think about wars? It becomes meaningless. That's why, if you ask me, the bad thing for the Middle East is that somewhere in Sinai there, a mega comet should fall. And they will all be afraid. <laughs> and maybe. But you see what I'm saying? I'm saying that in such a situation, international cooperation, real one, is a necessity. But what is happening today at the political level is the exact opposite. It's that the third world, critical as it is against Europe, is now assuming, taking the worst thing today of European legacy, fully sovereign nation states. This is happening in India with Modi, Hindu fundamentalism, in China, that's why they are screwing Uyghurs and Tibetans, in Turkey even, Putin is, it's, a, it's a, the situation is really, really bad. So to conclude, where am I? Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, pardon me. Uh, to conclude, really, you know what, where we should begin? Uh, I had a very, I will not go into it, you can find it on YouTube, uh, a terrible experience in uh, Germany in October at the Frankfurt Book Fair, where I said clearly, I condemned Hamas, Israel had the right to take revenge. But what I was basically doing was, I was quoting your Secretary of State Blinken, who said Israel had the right has the right to revenge, but how it does it, it concerns us all. I was saying things like that, and I couldn't believe my ears. Even under communism, it was not so bad. In the middle of it, it was the big introductory session, a guy stood up whose official title was kind of a commissar for anti-Semitism, like the unfractor, like each country in Germany has a guy, part of the government, which, uh, has to take care of, of uh, controlling anti-Semitism. The way they do it is they do everything possible to, of course, spread anti-Semitism. That's what worries me. That's why I have more than ever no friends in Israel. Are you aware that till now, anti-Semitism was more or less, more or less, a European affair? Then, now it's really spreading not just among the Arab countries, but even in the third world, Africa, Latin America, and so on. I prefer not to think about all this. So what I'm saying is that a guy stood up and started to shout at me. You are relativizing it. You are equating Hamas and, uh, uh, and Israel and so on, which I, of course, was not doing, but it, I was, to put it mildly, a little bit shocked, but to conclude with philosophy, what was really a bad surprise for me, it made me so depressed, is that a week or two later, as a reaction to me and some others, we didn't say Israel doesn't have any right to, we accepted all this, Hamas is terror and so on, annihilated, but, I was quoting, my God, the chief of their secret police. The key is give Palestinians a chance there. Palestinians on the West Bank are in a totally hopeless situation. So, this was a mega shock in Germany. Three philosophers, Jürgen Habermas among them, published a letter where they basically condemned my type of thinking without naming me and said total support for Israel. Now, this is, and with this I will conclude, a unique moment where 
you can see how an abstract philosophical question and concrete political decisions are connected. Because you know what's the difference between Jürgen Habermas, who is now practically a state philosopher of Europe, and, uh, and the first generation of Frankfurt School, Adorno Horkheimer. Adorno and Horkheimer, their main thesis is, it's the title of their famous short book, Dialectics of Enlightenment. It means, to cut a long story short, that the so-called, and they are, horrors of the 20th century, already before colonialism, but then uh, 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 Gulag, uh, 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 Shoah, and so on, they, they are not simply a remainder of some dark past. They are the product of the inner antagonisms, immanent racism, colonialism, and so on, of the European project of enlightenment. This doesn't mean let's drop enlightenment. It means let's use enlightenment to, but let's approach through enlightenment method the paradoxes of enlightenment itself. Let's see not just fascism, even a greater enigma is here Stalinism. We have there an event which at the beginning was, whatever you say, some kind of emancipatory event, tremendous liberation. You wait for 10 years, you get Stalin, and so on. So, you know, this approach, what, and uh, so this was the idea of Adorno Horkheimer. Then came Habermas, who, whose critical, sorry, crucial book is uh, Modernity as an Unfinished Project. The idea is no self-critique of enlightenment, just more radical enlightenment. So the idea is, yes, horrible things were done in Europe, but this is just because enlightenment wasn't fully enacted and so on. And what has this to do with uh, Gaza war? Because in this line of thinking, their approach is still, Israel is the only democracy there, and with this, I, up to a point, I agree. I'm well aware of, like, how Jews are practically prohibited even to enter most of the countries outside Israel. I know, I had a pleasant experience in Israel. When I entered it, I noticed that they don't step, uh, sorry, uh, they don't uh, stamp your passport. They just give you a piece of paper with stamp on it. And then I got it, why? So that, because if you had Israeli stamp, they, you will not be allowed to enter most of the like Syria, blah, blah, most of the countries around. So, but nonetheless, the problem of Israel is that it is, in some sense, go to West Bank, an apartheid state, and uh, I don't, here I must be precise, I don't dismiss all of Israel as colonization. I'm not following that line. First, if there were elements of colonization, the responsibility was that of Europe. Europe did something very comfortable. It killed, it did the Holocaust, and then it made the Arabs pay the price for it. You know, like it exported the problem. And this is why I find the present German stance so disgusting. The imminent logic is the following one. We did a horrible thing, so in exchange as an Admission of guilt, we will allow you to do your own horrible thing. You know, everybody knows that that's the thing. It's, it's, it's sim to put it simply terrifying. What I find especially humiliating is that the Germans who did the Holocaust will now teach us all how not to be anti-Semitic. Sorry, thanks. Begin with you there. So <coughs> the problem is this one. The traditional modernity enlightenment project is in a crisis. What we see today are 
its imminent reversals, antagonisms. We know the story from deconstruction and so on, how, uh, how uh, the universality of enlightenment categories is a fake, it has hidden normativity, excluding some people. But how to go forward without renouncing enlightenment, without saying, okay, we need to return to some old conservative uh, stance. This is the neo-fascist solution. And I use here the term fascist in a much more modest way. Not just Nazism, there is also something that we can call soft fascism. We had it up to a point in Spain, Portugal, Salazar, uh, and even I, ah, we have it today. It's the only genuine economic miracle, Singapore. I love the country, I was there 10 times. Singapore is a modern soft fascism. You have a little bit of democracy, but not too much, and the state controls the free market and it works. And uh, I think that, I cannot develop it now, that maybe up to a point even China today, there are some Chinese Marxists who claimed what really happened with Deng Xiaoping is a passage from socialism to soft fascism, you know, because fascism you can have fascism without anti-Semitism, but it works like this. What fascists see clearly is that liberalism, too much individualism, is in crisis. So they want modernity, but they see the destructive dimension of modernity, so they want central power grounded in some big national tradition, Hinduism in India, Confucianism in China, to control these antagonisms. In this sense, I think, not in the sense of Nazism and so on, but in this sense of soft fascism, we are approaching a new image of fascism. So I would only supplement my friend, although I often politically don't agree with him, Yanis Varoufakis, who speaks about techno-feudalism, adding that the political expression of this techno-feudalism is this new soft fascism. Again, it just means limited democracy, but the state really steers, controls the economy, and if you practice this rationally, I know I cannot say to what extent this works. The results can be very interesting, even positive, Look at how till now at least, but even now, I think we exaggerate the crisis of China. China, they, they're the party, Communist Party is not stupid. Whenever there is too much disturbance on the market, the state controls, limits, 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 how do you call it, stock exchange and so on. Maybe this is the, Solution, but it's a sad world if this is a solution. So I think to conclude, A, hey, the first task is to return from this naive European modernism Habermas to the basic lesson of Adorno and Horkheimer, dialectic of enlightenment. Our project, European of modernity, has its own inner antagonisms and we should begin here. We are no longer in a position to teach the third world. And second thing, new forms of serious obligatory international collaboration. Can you imagine what will happen if there is a mega ecological catastrophe in some part of the world? Tens, maybe hundreds of millions of people will have to be moved. This happened often in the past, but it was through war, occupation, and so on. Now, with nuclear arms and so on, we don't know what to do. So, again, I didn't talk about my title, but to really finish, my idea is that it's not just this Enlightenment project, but the whole notion of democratic authority, democratic leaders is disintegrating, so that we have on the one hand, anonymous technocrats, but then supplemented, supplemented by new obscene 
masters. This is why, to provoke you with the final thesis, I think the big task today, you will think I'm crazy, maybe I am, is to reinvent monarchy. Don't be afraid. Not <laughs> elect a king, but I read a very good analysis of the positive role that can be played by monarchs. It's that the system of democratic representation, due to its corruption, confusion, and so on, is less and less efficient. People simply do not, that's why Trump is winning, because people simply do not trust traditional parliamentary mechanisms. And the role played by a monarch can be, as Hegel described it, he shouldn't have any real power. He should, as it were, represent, the monarch should be an idiot like all of us, just so that you make it sure that the political class doesn't have executive class doesn't have all of power. And of course, I'm not for a return of monarchy. I'm for some kind of a lottery where maybe some jury or whatever, not, not, I don't want to, it's like jury, you know. Hegel saw it that the institution of injustice, the institution, how do you call it, jury, the system, that they are chosen by a lot. But why are they important? Because if not jury, then you have experts, lawyers to decide. That's for Hegel corruption. You're, if you are accused of crime, and I will denounce you and so on, then you have the right to be judged by your peers. That's the principle of jury. People who are like you, not specialists. And I'm of course not talking about monarchy, but about some kind of body chosen by lot, not part of the uh, political machine, and in different countries they are trying to reinvent it through popular gatherings and so on and so on. I went on too much, I'm very sorry, I hope it wasn't too boring, and thanks very much for your patience. <laughs>
level itself is encased in his own tears in the bottom of the cup, right? It's not simply, oh, God is exercising his judges, making a, a team display, right, of his power, so that we can uh, fall at his knees or anything. And it's not that the saints in heaven, right, are, um, how should I say this, they're not, they're not enjoying the pleasure, per se, the thing. They are rather, they are rather seeing the ultimate end of the choices of those people in, in hell, right? And that's what it's signifying. And I agree, I do not think that the Purgatorio and the Paradiso are enough discussed, right? Because there's a lot of rich signification there. In the Paradiso, right, there's the soldier that is outside the gates of the mountain that leads to paradise. And Dante, and I think it's, yes, yeah, the Virgo that's like, speak to him. And he says, you know, I was dying, I didn't live a good life, with the rest of my life, but I died with the Virgin's name on my lips. So I was saved. So I think that we need to apply when we speak about Dante more into the significations of what's going on there. It's not simply God's obscene punishment in hell, rather than simply the number of the game. And I think that that's what Thomas is talking about, right? Because he says, secondly, indirectly, by reason namely of something annexed to the justice rate, uh, where is this? Um, the divine justice and their own deliverance would be the direct cause of the joy of the blessed, while the punishment of the damned will cause it injury. So they're not enjoying the punishment, they're enjoying the, their teleological ends in God, finding their fulfillment, right? We're going to accept all the presuppositions here, while the damned are in, not enjoying, but they are suffering the consequences of where they are to, of where their choices led them. They have the ability to make that decision. So it's not necessarily God signifying his arbitrary power. It's not like Occam or somebody. It's not, it's not an act of the will. But this is the way that I think things are ordered. And then this carries into questions of how do we situate you know, Christian anthropology, right, in these questions. And it's a broad issue. I just wanted to know what you think. I, I, I can't possibly paraphrase that. So. <laughs> I got the point, but then, you know where, if I were to have time, where I would uh, uh, here complicate further things here. Uh, if you are talking about choice and so on, you know, I am here inclined to accept Hegel's reading, which is that uh, uh, the fall, the original sin, was planned and necessary. Without the fall, we are, Hegel says this literally, before the fall, we are animals. Through the fall, we experience, in contrast to evil, the, the goodness. So then, uh, this was a big problem. Uh, I followed a debate where even the Pope, present one whom I like, made the wrong choice. How do you say in that basic Christian prayer of Father in heaven, uh, how do you translate that line? And please uh, do not tempt us, lead us. Yeah, uh, some, for me, too liberal, modern, permissive Catholics claimed this attributes evil intention to God, as if God is saying, oh, let's enjoy ourselves a little bit and leave them in temptation. But it's uh, just protect us from, they want to neutralize it. But sorry, the whole story of the fall, God says, uh, now I will say it's very commonsensical, but uh, like if God didn't want us to fall into temptation, why did he have to build that, sorry, to build, to construct that apple tree with apples in the very heart of the paradise, you know? Like, it's obvious that uh, fall is part of the story, it is, as it were. So my problem is, and when you said, when you talked about, uh, uh, yes, I see your point, nice, about that it's not simply uh, uh, this simple punishment, but the fi final attribution. But you know that this is, if you know theology, a very problematic point in the sense that there are radically different interpretations within Christianity itself. Let me give you my favorite example. I wonder if you have an opinion. You know who was, her name is not known, but usually they invented a name for her, the wife of Pontius Pilatus. Catholics 
celebrate her as a saint, even up to. Because she told her husband, maybe this guy, Jesus, is a good, I feel something in him, do not know. Most of the Protestants claim the opposite, that he is, she is the voice of the devil. Why? Because through his death, Christ redeemed us. And she wanted to prevent this. It's a catastrophe. What would Christ be doing? Just an old guy, oh, fuck it, I was sent here to redeem humanity. Now I did. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I think that uh, things get, uh, what you said about Aquinas, yes, I know this distinction, and he sees it, but in a very primitive, you may disagree with it, in a very primitive way, I think that Aquinas is a little bit cheating himself. Of course, there is pleasure in seeing those suffering, but then he provides an escape. But no, no, I really, it's really about justice and so on. You know whose position I respect much more? Some radical Protestants who say, how do we know how God will judge? Don't even try to think about it. For them, I don't know which one, it's the ultimate obscenity to say you will be punished in hell. Who knows? It's total otherness. We cannot read in this sense, uh, read the mind of God. You know probably who is the most radical here. I love him. Uh, Malebranche. He goes too far, but he is the the uh, close to those uh, Port Royal Catholics who are for predestination, the only. And uh, his idea is crazy, it's obscene. It's that uh, God distributes mercy, like I am redeemed, you are lost, sorry, that's lie, no? But uh, he said, uh, in a totally contingent way, Nothing to do with our virtues. So he said, maybe you are a much better guy than me. But God's decision is arbitrary. I am redeemed. You are lost. And so that you, you will not think that I am falsifying things. He even uses this terrifying metaphor, Malbronch. He said, imagine two fields. On one field, there is a good farmer who does all the work. On the other field, it's so so a more lazy farmer. But because of loss of nature, all the rain falls on the field of the lazy farmer. So he will get something, while the hardworking one will get nothing. And that's his metaphor, that uh, I think that there is something good in this metaphor, I'm not, I'm not trying to play this obscene game, God is evil, and so on. What I'm trying to say, and that is why, although I'm in a Catholic place, I think, no, I have a certain sympathy for predestination, because the big worry of Protestant was that the moment you link your redemption to your good works, you introduce a trade exchange. Oh my God, if I save that child, then maybe I will go. And the problem of Protestants is how to not that you shouldn't be good because you expect a reward. No? It gets... So I... Thanks for the question. We don't have time to go longer. Just that you must know, maybe even better than me, that there are big debates here. Like, I was a, a couple of years ago in Munich, Germany, had a debate with bishops. Very friendly debate. And then I asked them, what would be your answer? A very simple answer, uh, question, among many, that I have. When Christ is dying on the cross and has this Eli, Eli, Lama, Father, why have you forsaken me? Is Christ bluffing or not? Bluffing in the sense that he really knows I am up there, he just, because if Christ is not bluffing, then it's true that as Chesterton, the great Catholic, put it, God himself becomes almost a desperate atheist for a moment. God doesn't believe in God. If God is bluffing, then, and Malbranche has this obscene reading, then the whole of crucifixion is, is just a spectacle to convince people. So I'm not saying these are arguments against Christianity. I think we have to confront this 
paradoxes to come to the truth of it. It's not a simple thing, Christianity, you know. I'm not saying that it's elaborate, but precisely when it violates our common sense, it gets closest to, let's call it traditionally, deep spiritual truth. If you simplify Christianity, sorry, I talk too much, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see if we can get a few more in, and I'll, I, I'll get the, the James Bond thing, so that if you talk too much, you'll get it. <laughs> so, so my question is not from a more of a theological standpoint. Um, I just wanted, it's just a, more of a political type question. Um, you made a significant point to bring up how in the Israeli political system, it's highly divided, uh, and as someone who's Jewish and someone who who focuses a lot on the Israeli politics is completely true. But my question comes down to really democracy and leftist governments when it comes to the Lockean theory of self-agency. Because it appears, uh, it really Locke's view on self-agency that people determine their, Locke, Locke. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah where people determine, uh, you know, have agency and choose the government that they wish to live under. And it appears that, I guess, in the larger European Western discourse of things, that the Palestinian people uh, have no agency and thus are infallible people, and the Jews or the Israelis have only agency and actively choose to participate in the activities of the West Bank or the, you know, war without end as currently going in Gaza, as opposed to looking at it as two people with agency and with, all, with their own internal political systems. And my thing is, how do we as a democratic nation, or, sorry, democratic Western society, kind of go forward with that? Because it appears that the left is, the right I'm just going to discount as being, they choose to discount all forms of agency, but on the left particularly, they seem to, the modern left seems to be um, okay with allowing crimes against humanity and, you know, saying things like rape is resistance and whatnot, but then at the same time we'll say, we believe in agency, but then it's the, well, why don't you grant everyone agency, so. I, if I got you correctly, yeah. but I have yeah. difficult, I deeply agree with you because the first thing I noticed in, is that, First, it was, who cares about Palestinian suffering in Gaza? It's, uh, it's uh, Hamas doing it, yeah. uh, IDF is just the mediator. Then, at a certain point, it become legitimate to sympathize with Palestinians in Gaza, but as victims. Yeah. They are good as long as they suffer. If they want to become agents, no? And yeah. that's what that uh, uh, ILAN or whatever, the, the ex-boss of uh, Shin uh, Bet saw it clearly. Yeah. That, that uh, they, uh, and uh, I think this is not a non-solvable problem because I know the situation in Palestine and if they, this may even be, I'm here very open, a good influence of being in the state of Israel more than other Arab countries, the Palestinians in Israel, only in areas controlled by Israel, have the potential to become genuine political agents. I don't trust that this can happen. Like, I'm, I have here no taboos, no? Let's say by some miracle, they, uh, Israel totally withdraws and Hamas returns power. What do you think? That this will be a feminist democratic society or what? Yeah. You know, like, like I'm ready to accept all these paradoxes that at the same time that Israel is oppressing them, it is at the same time necessarily, that's the dialectic of modernity, installing in them values or whatever you say, norms, I hate these terms, of how to uh, revolt in a way which will not be simply uh, a return to their tradition, but what really worries me, and I spoke with you, with our friends here, is that why is Israel doing what it is doing, which will lead to such an explosion of anti-Semitism for example, in Germany, my good friend, totally pro-Palestinian, Udi Aloni, the filmmaker, he was in Berlin 
and at the all of October, and there were pro-Palestinian demonstrations, and he went there, but then he was shocked, you know. There were parts of the crowd shouting like, guess the Jews sent them to, and so on. So I claim, don't, you know that anti-Semitism is still much stronger in democratic Europe de facto than among Arab countries. It's interesting here to go into history. I read a detailed history critical, not celebrating of the greatest, Saladin, no? Yeah, yeah. You know that when crusaders occupied Jerusalem, they kept the Arabs as servants, Jews out. And when Saladin reoccupied Israel, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Jerusalem, one of his first edicts was, Jews, it's safe for you to return. So it's very tragic how resistance to Jews exploded only in not even late 90s, 20th century among Arabs. And you know, I think the great guilty person here, or person, state, is united at that point, what was this British Empire. Uh, and uh, because uh, it's so tragic how Israel, when they were fighting for independence, like I read some text by Begin and those uh, earlier, they all focused on resisting the British. They didn't even approach, my God, but there is a majority here, you know, a Palestinian majority. And I think already at that point, there would have been a chance if Jews were to approach directly the people there, it, it all went wrong because uh, Jews, uh, uh, you know, they took it as the only problem will Israel, will uh, United Kingdom international community, it, it went wrong, or it's, it's a big catastrophe. And again, what really worries me is that Hamas and the present Israeli government, basically they both want the war. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, That's I, I, yeah. really sad. <laughs> Israeli government wants the war because they know that only if there is war, they will be able to colonize uh, fully the West Bank, because, you know, if you say now in Germany, uh, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free, whatever, you are practically arrested. But you know that two months ago, Netanyahu used this formula, just in the Jewish sense. He said, yes, from the river to the sea, big Israel or whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I am, what worries me most with all the suffering there is again how Putin and so on are inscribing the Gaza war in the same anti-colonial, as a kind of a anti-colonial resistance equating Israel with Ukraine and then claiming in the same way that Ukraine government was terrorizing Russians, Israel is, and this is the worst thing that can happen, that it will be the developed West alone, and Putin is triumphantly succeeding here. All other, with a couple of exceptions, like Australia, Singapore, India, but Asia, Africa, South America, basically on Putin's side. And I'm simply a pessimist here. Is, I was trying to square it off, and it just seems that the left traditionally, which is critical of Israel, and I think in many ways justifiably critical, particularly, I'm looking at this from a labor Zionist sort of way, where Netanyahu's government is allowing, you know, going further right so he doesn't go to jail, has given up, has given up individual, uh, individualism and sovereignty of the oppressed classes in order to paint this image that they don't think. And it seems like the Europeans want to, once again, I don't know, kind of save a group of people without having to actually involve themselves, but instead it is just allowing the worst parts, as you said, of anti-Semitism and racism to refester into itself. No, but you know where I agree with you? I'm not sure I got it because I don't hear it uh, well. Uh, 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 I, uh, like, uh, I agree with you in this critique of the lab that 
much of the Western European left definitely sounds anti-Semitic. And I'm horrified by that. It's not a joke, you know. They claim, no, 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 we don't mean it, not at all, but, but uh, 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 I don't think against that, with all my sympathy for Palestinians, that the state of Israel can be reduced to a project of colonization. It's not as simple as that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, it's, again, uh, uh, my utop, you know, now I will put it in a positively racist terms. I know the people there, and you know that in a good sense. Palestinians are almost, it will sound brutal, the Jews among the Arabs, you know. They are not primitives, they are the most enlightened. Do you know that I heard now some interesting data? Now, now, in spite of all problems, there are in Israeli, in Israel, pre 67 Israel, hospitals and um, health structure. There are 5,000 nurses and 2,000 doctors, Palestinians. It's so, uh, you know, like, there is another part of the story here. It's not just uh, primitive uh, Palestinians and so on. What, what really worries me is, for example, it shocked me. You remember when Netanyahu used the term Amalek yeah. for Palestinians? Yeah. That was madness. You know what happens with Amalek? Joshua, the follower of Moses is on the hill, and God comes and tells him, kill them all, women, animals, children. And Joshua has a moment of, of doubt and says, really? And God says, yeah, 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 and so on. So I don't think it's so nice to use the metaphor of total ethnic slaughter to describe what... Uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just uh, 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 terrifying, because the data are also... What is the result is now that even if they kill practically all the Hamas, those surviving, are, they, are, they are breeding new terrorists there. It's clear. If anything among the people in Gaza, Hamas has now maybe even a greater support than before, not to mention this, that now, according to some opinion polls in Israel, around 90%, now, not 19, 90, are against two-state solution. That is to say, from the river to the sea. And it's, uh, uh, I, I, I know what is to be done, like that uh, ex-chief of secret police knows. Yeah, you, you view them as people. As, Sorry? You view them as people, as two people with agency that can interact. I mean... Yeah, I agree, but I have less and less Trust, you know, and I have, maybe you will like this, another problem with the left. Left from time to time takes over. Give me one example where they didn't screw it up in the long no, term. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. one example, I know two, three examples. Like, uh, 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 and I consider myself left. Like, I must say honestly, and I really know the situation well there. Bolivia under Morales. They didn't care too much the capital, the standard of ordinary people really went up. That's why a miracle happened. You remember there was a coup d'etat? Then there were elections when they won, where they won again. But look at Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, it's a nightmare. You know, that's why this is what I meant by that moderately conservative communism. You know, I'm sick and tired of the, that left, which, in, oh my God, on some stupid square, Tahrir, Sintagma, one million people, or our hearts were beating. Fuck it, what interests me is the morning after. What happens when this enthusiasm is over and life returns to normal? How will ordinary people feel the difference. There was a moment of hope with uh, Aristide, I think, in Haiti, but it was, uh, you know what's so sad? Peter Holbert wrote a book, Flooding, uh, Damning the Flood, or what, that basically the West never, never forgave uh, 
Haitians for the successful revolution, rebellion, yeah. 1800, no? And it's, if you look at the numbers, it's they, they were systematically ruining Haiti. Do you know that to be reincorporated into the developed, uh, to trade with the West, you know that Haiti had to pay the West, uh, pay for what? For the property they stole, for slaves who live in And you know that in the second half of 19th century, the sum was between 60 and 80% of their state budget. Okay, you know when the last sum was paid? After World War II. So they took care to, to, to make it, and then there was that nightmare, Duvalier, the dictator, and so on. They were systematically ruining the country. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I know if other people have questions, I'm so we and people could stay longer, but we we, okay. we have to. I yeah. Answer like clap with one hand or whatever. <laughs> so that's funny no. that you say Zen Buddhist because I was actually going to bring up what you spoke about regarding uh, the Bhagavad Gita and Heinrich Himmler having it in his pocket, and then you spoke earlier about the obscenity of the modern authoritarian and this blind animal vindication that se people seem to be seeking. Do you think that in a potentially a Christian or Hebrew anthropology that the fear of some kind of divine punishment in the afterlife could, could prevent that sort of thing that you have Himmler, you know, he's justifying his actions by separating them using this oneness of these beings are just being annihilated into the greater being. But then you could also have uh, in a you know Abrahamic anthropology, him fearing to commit these actions because of the divine retribution. Do you think that that could be something that could motivate the this movement into this obscenity from going too far to have this reemergence of this Hebrew or Christian sense of some divine justice? I'm sorry. I didn't uh, get it uh, uh, too uh, correctly. My basic point is, my basic point is just this one, a very simple one. That was my problem with Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the way I read this Hebrew iconoclasm, don't paint God and so on, or even the Christian notion of Holy Spirit, it's, you know, like, what, how was that uh, TV series? about aliens invading. <laughs> the truth is out there. X-Files. X-Files, yes. In the sense that I think that if you go deep into yourself, you find dirty stories that you invent to justify your, I think the truth is out here in how you interact with others. And this is why I think in e Jewish religion already you have iconoclasm. It means not God up there, imageless. It doesn't mean God is beyond. It means, no, God is in how I interact with you and others. Or that's how I read even the Holy Ghost. You know, for me, the key passage is when uh, some uh, apostles ask Christ, how will you know that I will return? And he simply answers, when there will be love between two of you, I will be there. So I think that very radical reading, all that topic, Jesus will come back and so on, it's a pseudo topic. In community of believers, Jesus is already here. You, right. We don't need, what, he will come at some point. No, he is already here. And Hegel, as a philosopher, knew this. The first one, just to finish, is I really believe in them. The key point for me are the so-called Rhine, Rhine, the river in Germany, Rhine mystics, beginning with Meister Eckhart and then Jacob Böhme and so on, who saw this, how God fully becomes God only through humans. As they say, not only is God 
the cause of humans, but in some sense, God is born retroactively through humans. And of course, they don't mean it in this vulgar materialist way, of course, because we invented God. No, they mean it much more radically. And this is what Hegel saw in some sense, and you can even trace this to some formulations of Marx and so on, you know. But, okay, sorry, I'm too... <laughs> okay, we, we have to end. Th thank you, everybody. Thanks to Slavon. <laughs> <laughs>